Welcome back to the podcast, Two Gals in a Glass Half Full. Uh, today, it's just going to be me because Dr. Bobby is not feeling well, but that's okay because we've got this great episode. If sleep is something that you are interested in learning more about, maybe you're struggling with not sleeping well, or you just want to learn a little bit more about like why is sleep super important, then this episode is for you. So today, I've got a special guest with us. This is Dr. Ishan, and she works in this realm of sleep, and we're going to be kind of having this collaborative conversation, and I'm super excited about it. Uh, but before we get started, uh, Dr. Ishan, what's in your glass? Hi, uh, thank you for having me. I actually just uh, brew a cup of hot tea. So it's type of Chinese black tea I brought from China. Yeah, I love that. Uh, and so I've got in my glass, I've got a uh, cup of kombucha because I'm just working mm. on my probiotics and trying to get that in where I can with um, food or drink. So, uh, so Dr. Yishan, uh tell us a little bit about you. What's your what's your background? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I grew up in China and then I came to America to study clinical psychology. So I work as a psychologist, mostly deal with uh, mental health disorders. Uh, after I got my license, actually. I accidentally learned sleep is a specialty that uh, you can learn deeper, which I never knew before. I only know about sleep hygiene, right? But in my clinical work, I ran into the problem that sleep hygiene cannot help some patients. They already did everything they could to control their environment. They still could not sleep well. They may have clinical insomnia. And then what should I do? Uh, so that motivated me to pursue sleep medicine. And uh, then I got certified um, board certification in that to really treat insomnia and deal with different sleep disorders. The more I learn about sleep, the more I don't know. So it's a field that actually really amazed me. Yeah. And like sleep is one of those things that you don't like, you don't realize how important it is, but then you do think like, well, if they torture people by sleep depriving them, right? Then it must be important, right? Because if you right. restrict it and it's considered to be torture, then like, ah, so the complexity of sleep is, is huge. And like you said, like you still don't know so much and you've studied it extensively. And so right. that's the biggest thing is like, don't feel bad if this is your struggle. It's hard to understand. There are so many different pieces that have to align in order for you to get good quality restorative sleep. And there could be okay. a lot of different issues all happening. There could be one issue. It, it's, it just kind of depends on, on you and your situation. Right. I remember when I first started learning sleep, uh, I shadowed my professor in Stanford Sleep Medicine Center, and she would say eight different uh, insomnia patients per day. And all eight of them are diagnosed with insomnia, but the treatment is different <laughs> for every single patient, right? And you mentioned uh, sleep deprivation earlier and also shifting our circadian rhythm, shifting when we go to bed, when we get up from day to day, like shift workers, that's very harmful to our health too. I remember I was reading this one research uh, while I was studying. It was so interesting. People did some research on uh, rats and they just feed them very late, just uh, kind of opposite of their natural circadian rhythm and make them eat and sleep in a totally different time um, like pattern. And then after a while, all these rats died. And I think that really damaged their health somehow. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, like when you're sleeping, that's when your immune system is functioning. And so that's when you're going to like detoxify the brain. That's when you're like going to a lot is happening in your body when you're sleeping, which is why when you wake up, you're like, oh, man, I feel so much better. I feel restored. I feel like I can start a new day. It's also why when you don't sleep well, you're like, I feel like a train hit me. I feel terrible. It's like, it's like what has happened? And it's just like, that's the difference between good sleep and bad sleep with how our body actually functions. So it's, it's, it's super important. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I was gonna say, what are some of the common sleep myths? There's a lot of misinformation out there. Yeah, there are 
quite a lot. Um, I'm also curious what your audience most uh, interested in. I can share several to just get started. Yeah. Feel free to ask me anything pop in your mind. So uh, often I see patients coming into my clinic asking, well, I really want to get eight hours of sleep per day, right? All these doctors, all the social media, they talk about at least you need to get seven hours sleep or eight hours sleep. Well, um, how I can get that? If I ask them, like, when was the last time you got seven or eight hours sleep consistently, right? Day after day for a while. So they're like, never. <laughs> Some people would say never yeah. because everyone is different. Some people are born to be a short sleeper. They may just need five-ish hours to function great. I have friends personally. They said they only sleep like four or five hours per day and they feel so energetic during the day. They are not bothered by the short sleep at all. So it does not impact their function. I also personally know people and in my clinical work, I also noticed some patients, they need more than nine hours of sleep per day or else they just cannot really function well. So I think it's such a spectrum. <laughs> Right. If we carry a fixed wheel, we I have to sleep for how many hours? I have to sleep in what way? Then uh, we may get ourselves into trouble. Another common one is um, I uh, good sleep. What good sleep means? A lot of people tell me, oh, I want to fall asleep immediately. And once I open my eyes, it's morning sunshine. I jump out of my bed, I'm ready to go. A lot of people somehow think this kind of sleep is the ideal perfect sleep. That's what they are driving for, they are pursuing. Uh, in reality, that's very rare. So, <laughs> so a lot of people actually take about half an hour-ish to fall asleep. And in the middle of the night, it's very, very healthy and normal for most people to wake up multiple times. And actually the average is about 12 times per night. We, a normal healthy adult need to wake up. We just uh, don't remember most of that. So sleep is just like, we have deep sleep. We have light stage of sleep. We have REM sleep, which is our dreaming. Those are all important, right? So I, I see a lot of people carry this wrong belief. Or I don't want uh, REM sleep. I don't want to dream. Uh, I want more deep sleep. I want this. I want that. I want my sleep look this way. <laughs> so I think that's caused a lot of problem too. Yeah, I can see that because it's like, it's just, I mean, in the, in a different sense, it's like, well, I'm going to have a baby and this is how it's going to happen. It's like, no, there's going to be certain things that we're not in control of. <laughs> and so the exact how long each cycle lasts and the, the specificity of what sleep look like, there, that's not... Um, you can't control every single aspect of, of how, what's going to happen with your body. I do think there's a, an acceptance of like, this is how I feel good. And it's okay that it looks different than my friend or neighbor or coworker that's telling me about whatever their sleep is and how wonderful it is. Um, so your norm is going to just be different than somebody else's. And that's, it's as simple as that. Yeah, when we talk about sleepiness, I actually have questions for you too. Yeah. Because one of the common questions I, I got asked is about uh, whether eating or drinking certain things before bedtime is healthy. And uh, um, I don't know whether it's type of myth. A lot of people think drinking hot milk before bedtime would really help them. Um, and or some people think doing some kind of... Um, certain type of movement uh, before bedtime will be helpful. So I know there's some science behind nutrition and the movement before bedtime. I also know there's certain limitations around that. So I'm curious in your view, what do you think about this? Are these myths or they are actually truth? Again, it's definitely gonna be case by case for sure. So when we think about, let's do movement first. So we've got to think about like what physiologically is happening when we move and what physiologically is happening when we want to fall asleep. And so when we move, we're going to get everything heightened, right? We're going to increase our breathing rate. We're going to get um, our body, like we're going to like get muscle flowing to muscles. We're going to amp everything up. And so, and that amped up is going to take time to then calm back down. So ideally, if we are going to do movement, later into the evening it'd be more movement that's movement that helps 
with that calm down kind of helps with like how we're going to be ending our day and stepping down our brain function and like we're a boop 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 and we're going to just kind of start that like de-escalating so yoga um you know some breathing techniques stretching all of that is going to be much better movement for the end of the day Typically, I give my patients things that are going to incorporate breathing with movement. So stretching where you can incorporate your breath is going to be something that I do before bed. One, it helps with preparing our bodies to be still for a long period of time, which can be hard if you're trying to recover from an injury that's creating inflammation because you know, you're not having things flush that inflammation while you're still. Um, and we're going to kind of start that process of like getting the body to simmer back down again. Um, but normally you're not going to go lift heavy, go run, things like that, and then try and sleep within an hour. Um, that's going to be a little bit hard. We're really going to want it. We're going to want a number of hours after a more difficult workout um, for them to be able to get into sleep and truly, truly sleep and not just lay there trying to sleep. <laughs> mm. um, when it comes from nutrition. So think very similar. So if I am going to be doing something where I'm uh, consuming something that's going to take my body time and energy to break it down, like a large meal, things like that, something that's caffeinated, high has got a lot of sugar in it, things like that, my body is going to be amping up to work to break that down. But I'm trying to lie down and sleep. <laughs> so, uh, so drinking warm milk, there's, you know, there is... Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a nutritionist by any means. Um, but there is some thought that when we heat milk, we're going to release some aspects of what's in that milk. That's going to help our body simmer. Um, I don't know truth into that. Um, it is relaxing. It's warm. There's, it's just like drinking a little bit of warm tea. That's non-caffeinated things that are just overall relaxing to the body that our parasympathetic nervous system is going to be kicking in and that cascade of hormone release. That's like that rest and digest phase of like, um, so we can use nutrition in that way, as long as we're not using nutrition to amp. Um, so that's just overall, when we talk about that, like coming down to end our day, um, we really actually want to work our way back down again. Um, mm. so, um, if warm milk, works for you and you sleep better with it and you're not lactose intolerant drink some more milk <laughs> just brush your teeth um before you know you don't want that sitting on your teeth um but otherwise like you know there's it's not i wouldn't say it's something that's necessary uh, but it might be helpful to some people yeah yeah and i'm sh pretty sure there are some kind of uh, placebo effects in it for right. some people too right Absolutely. if they the so far believe that yeah. Exactly. I think a lot of it's just how it's it's calming. Your mom probably gave it to you when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have like a positive emotional response to that. Um, and all of that's fine, right? <laughs> like it's yeah. all fine. Like if you drink it and you feel better, do it. Um, but it's if you're not able to fall asleep, well, I don't know that drinking warm milk is gonna be the answer. Um, there's probably some other stuff contributing to why you're having difficulty falling asleep. Um yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. While we are talking about sleep mist, that reminds me another one I see often people bring up is like if they have insomnia, they try to work out so hard in the morning or during the day. Right. And uh, some of my patients even tell me they hiking so hard and so exhausted, they still could not sleep at night and they are so frustrated. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, to me, like in sleep medicine, we talk about different systems, uh, wak wakening system and sleep system. These two work together. In general, yes, if we try to active our wakening system during the day more, it actually helps us to have a stronger sleep drive at night so we can uh, possibly fall asleep a little bit easier, but there are also some nerve system uh, happening in this process. I think I notice for my patients, if they are too anxious or they are worrying too many things, or they are worrying about sleep itself, they have high sleep anxiety, right? Once think about sleep, think about bed, thinking about bedroom, they are so stressed out. They feel like, like no confidence I'm gonna fall asleep since I have insomnia for a while. Then, I think no matter how hard they try to weaken up their body during the day to exercise, they cannot shut down that 
brain, the nerve system at night. Uh, so that's what I noticed. But I want to understand from your perspective, right? How do you think about the daytime exercise to help people sleep at night? Yeah, no, I think daytime exercise is great. Like, don't get me wrong. I mean, you definitely want to use your body's energy because we we wake up, we fuel our body with food, water, coffee. And so we're amping up like our body wants to do work. That's it's us. We have muscles, we have tendons, we have ligaments, we have that's what we're kind of built to do. So we want to use our body to do work. And then once we end the day, that's when we kind of want that day to end. So when we've been sedentary all day, it's like we've been eating, we've been drinking, we've been like, okay, like, well, let's go to work. And you're like, no, let's sleep. So exercise during the day kind of does that. Like when we think of our, our rhythm of the day, right? We kind of like, we wake up and I, you know, unless you're seven, you know, I don't know many people that wake up and like, are like, hi, the day has started, right? You know, um, I've got, I've got two kids and they wake up. <laughs> like Most adults do not do that. Um, you wake up, right? We come out of those stages of sleep, you know? And so we start our day and we have our, you know, have maybe have a little coffee, have some tea, have some breakfast. We're going to start our energy coming up. We're going to do some quieter activity. We might be checking emails, you know, whatever that rhythm of the day is. And then we're going to kind of start coming up before lunch. We're going to start, our body's going to be ready for for some more right so then we're gonna be like oh now i'm like i'm getting a little bit a little bit hungry i need a little rest we're gonna pause we're gonna fuel a little bit more with food right food water um, we might have a little rest we might sit and eat because we've been moving during the day and then we're gonna have our afternoon where we're gonna come back up again right now we're ready for a little bit more activity so we give our body we might go for a walk you know things like that and then it's like oh hmm, uh oh my glucose levels are getting low then we're going to sit and have dinner, right? And then now we're going to start to come back down again. And so if we think of our day as that kind of a rhythm, then we're going to give our body what it needs during the time that's most appropriate for it. And I get it. Like I work, I, you know, I work in an office all day. I'm not at 10 a.m. going for a run, <laughs> you know, but there is going to be times where like, I'm going to be up, I'm going to be moving, right? I'm, I'm working with patients and that's more my active time. Um, that's my active time. Now I'm going to pause. I, I mean, I do my runs in the morning just because that's just better for me than trying to get it in at the end of the day. So my morning run, working with patients and then ah, here's my lunch. I'm going to have that little pause. Then my afternoon, boom, I've got patients. I'm going, 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 going. And then now I'm going to start to pause dinner. Now we're going to start our like that, you know, helping with homework, we're going to do more sedentary tasks. So now by the time of the, we're getting towards the end of the day, now I've had hours really of like amping back down again. So that kind of helps me. It helps a lot of my patients when we really start to structure our day more systemically, it's called glucose regulation. So we want to keep our glucose levels kind of regulated throughout the day. So we're not getting overly hungry and overly thirsty and then crashing our system with too much at once. And if we can kind of keep our bodies more regulated like that, it it's ready for the relax. It can predict that it's coming. The body's not waiting. Like, are you going to feed me? Are you not? It was happening. That anxiety that your body has, like, because its systems are constantly not getting what they need. So there's a lot of different things that can cause that. Like I'm having a hard time relaxing and coming back down at the end of the day. So glucose regulation is part of it. Activity regulation is part of it. Anxiety, like negative connotation with sleep. So many things can contribute to that. Um, but that activity part and, and, and glucose regulation during the day, um, is really big for, um, just overall keeping your body and a, your systems in a place where they trust what's going to happen next. Cause that's the thing it's trust. So you can actually relax. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that totally makes sense. If I understand correctly, it um, sounds very similar to how we think about sleep. You need to trust your body. First, you need to understand the signals in your body, exactly. right? Yeah. And from moment to moment, what it needs, and then build more trust because you you know your biology is strong enough to help you sleep, mm -hmm. just like uh, we know we are hungry sometimes and should we eat or not. So a lot of time we, we associate actually eating um, a feeling of hungry 
with sleep, feeling of sleepy. Um, yeah, and in sleep, it's very important to be consistent, to have a pattern, right? Yeah. Consistent pattern. And yeah. sounds like uh, in your work, the eating, glucose control, uh, management, and uh, exercise, activity management, it also needs some kind of build a routine, build a pattern, and keep it consistent. Yeah, because your body can trust it. It knows mm -hmm. what's going to happen next, you know? So there's not this, like this period of time where it's like all of a sudden you're going to put this demand on your body that it's not ready for. So if it's almost like if we don't sleep well, we almost have this tendency like to beat ourselves up. Like I'm going to beat myself in the submission. I'm going to be so overly tired that like there's no chance but to fall asleep. And well, that doesn't really, that doesn't work very well, right? Because you, you don't really want to be beating yourself up like that. It's more about that acceptance of like, like I want to fuel my body. I want to move my body and I want my body then to be able to, to rest and recover without feeling traumatized <laughs> along the way. Yeah. So let's decrease trauma um, and increase acceptance. And um, from there, it, it really does go a lot better. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I know for me, I need a full hour at the end of the day, like an hour of just not thinking. You know, like I can't open up my computer. I can be checking emails. I can't all of that kind of stuff where I have to use processing and reasoning and thinking about the next day and all of that. I need that to be done. And I just need to like quietly read, um, sit and watch a show that's just mindless. Um, you know, I read stories to my kids, things where it's just like, it's just, I don't, I'm not on, I'm not thinking, I'm not worrying about tomorrow, all of that. If I'm thinking about tomorrow, I write it down or I put it in my calendar as a notification to like notify me tomorrow when I can do something, something about this. Um, I know a lot of people that need more time than they give themselves before they try and go to sleep. So like, Oh, it's time. <laughs> um, exactly. So I don't know Have you found that like that. Are there these yeah. amounts of time that people mm -hmm. need before they can just go to sleep? Right. So true. I see a lot of patients and uh, they already have struggles with stress, anxiety, and sleep issues. And then they expect themselves to be a computer. I can just shut down myself, go to sleep immediately, right? right. <laughs> One minute, done. Yeah. Of course, it's not happening. And then yeah. if they have symptoms of insomnia, uh, day after day after day, and then they got super stressed out. So uh, that's exactly what we call wind down period or buffer time before sleep. It's so important. Uh, even for myself, similar to you, I shut down my computer or stop checking my work-related email uh, by evening time, right? And then I reserve basically the whole night to, if I can, to do something chill, relaxing, fun, basically something I don't need to think very much exactly not very uh, much yeah. not very much yeah unless I have deadlines I have to catch up right uh that's rare but even that I have to be careful to make sure that does not eat up my sleep time because mm -hmm. actually if we prioritize sleep our daytime performance our function can really improve oh yeah I noticed yeah. that dramatically uh when I was in graduate school so I had a terrible um sleep habits in undergrad. I was awful. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I would stay up until two, three o'clock in the morning, writing papers, studying for exams. I performed well. I had, I had good grades and all of that. Um, but it also wasn't the level of um, learning and retention that I really needed in graduate school. And so, so I had those, you know, those four years and I mean, you know, I crammed a lot in there, you know, then I took two years off before I went to graduate school and I lived abroad. I worked in the wilderness. I did all, all sorts of like really cool things. And this perspective came over me of like, I need to prioritize uh, my health. <laughs> like, like I can't, I can't be pushing myself like that till three o'clock in the morning and then trying to perform all day. That doesn't make any sense. You know, I'm running on fumes. And so when I started graduate school, I was like, I had this like very strict, I will be in bed by 10 and up by six. And if I am not ready for the test, 
I'm not ready. You know, like I still have class all day. I have one exam and the rest is all class time where I'm listening to lectures on all of these other classes. So if I put all of my eggs into this basket of like, cr like cramming for an exam and I'm missing all of these lectures, then I'm like, that doesn't make sense. And so it was like, all of a sudden it was like this freedom came over me of like, I can balance this. I can sleep and I'm retaining so much more information. My studying is so much faster. Uh, it was, it was great. And I, I've just been like that ever since. I mean, there's times where it is what it is. Like you just have to push through, you know, it's only going to last for this period of time. And then you'll get back into your balance. I'm never perfectly balanced ever. Um, but like, it is really important that routine helps tremendously and know that like staying up that extra two or three hours, is it actually going to get you what you need? Is it going to get you over the, or is it, are you going to fall behind in all these other places because you put all the eggs into one basket? Um, so that's you, you're the only person that can answer the question. It's, it's your journey, your scenario. I just yeah. challenge this. I do this with patients. I just, I'm going to challenge you, like, think about it. Like everything in life that has to be balanced is this one thing worth it for everything else to fall behind. Um, so, um, what are other, like, like just that, that common, like, let's say like melatonin, right? Like mm -hmm. everyone's like, Oh, I'm just going to pop a melatonin. I can't sleep. I'm going to pop a melatonin and boom, it's going to work like magic. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't if it can it. really work that way, that would be amazing. <laughs> would it? That would be amazing. Um, so yeah, but uh, that magic effect to be able to like get us to sleep right who don't want the magic pill right i mean everyone yeah. wanted either melatonin or something else nowadays i feel like we are i'm not sure whether we are in a crisis or something you can see sleep advertisement everywhere okay. i went back to china this summer even on the bus it's like <laughs> on top of the advertisement is about oh if you have insomnia call us at this 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 number yeah. you're like gonna call <laughs> them i just want to see what you have to say like <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's amazing people are not sleeping well and then in the supermarket or cvs you will just see all this sleep products you know for melatonin the problem is there's a research several years ago done by a Canada research team Right. They really just study uh, all this melatonin uh, products on the market. What they find out is it actually contains melatonin that does not really match what's on the label of the bottle. What they find is uh, what actually really in the melatonin pills is totally different than what you read on the label on the bottle. So you think you are taking melatonin, but you are taking a lot of many other things within that pill. The amount of melatonin is could be as much as 400% more than what is labeled. Yeah. So it's just not so well regulated. Yeah. And also uh, in sleep medicine, we often really suggest people to be cautious, depends on what you really need. Melatonin, we have to understand, it's not something can... Uh, replace sleeping pills. It does not work the same way. It does not put you to sleep. It's really just something your body naturally released, right? We naturally all have melatonin. We possibly have enough already. We only need this little bit, about 0.8 milligram to enough to help us feel sleepy enough to sleep. And people tend to eat so much more, like five milligram, 10 milligram, very often on the market. That's too much. When it's too much, you will feel drowsy in the morning. So it's not a good idea to take so, so much melatonin. It, it won't really help you to fall asleep like that. Yeah. So what are, like, what are ways that our body just naturally releases melatonin? Mm -hmm. that yeah, like we, right. Uh, just darkness, right? <laughs> like I is in the evening time at night. Uh, if you are doing some activities within the house, try to dim the light more and more when you are getting closer to the bedtime. And that's the cue. Light is really the cue for our brain and body start sensing. Oh, it's nighttime and they start releasing the melatonin several hours after releasing melatonin 
we will feel the highest sleep drive. We will be sleepy enough, ready to go to bed. If the whole house is so bright all night long until the moment you sleep, then you don't give your body enough chance to release enough melatonin. But there are some exceptions. Uh, if a child is on the spectrum, is like uh, autism spectrum, for example, and there are some research showing children uh, on the spectrum may not release enough melatonin naturally in their body. So for them, they need to take supplements. They possibly need to take a lot of melatonin supplements to really help to regulate the sleep. So yeah. they're, you know, special situations. But for most people, most adult children, it should already be enough. Yeah. I think like what you pointed out with the, the light around you is something that I've, I've worked with personally myself big time. Uh, Cause it trying, when I went through in, in graduate school and I was really trying to work on my sleep and like actually calm my body down to by 10, be ready for sleep, which was hard for me to like make that transition. Um, cause I used to stay way too late. Like I said before, when I was an undergrad, um, that was probably one of the major things I changed was just the lighting around me and mm -hmm. just bringing those lights down and just making, making it aware to my body that like, we're entering, <laughs> like we're entering this next phase of our day. <laughs> right. Um, it's the same thing we do now. We call it relax time in our house. And during relax time, everything comes down. Like our noise level comes down. Our volume of our voices come down. The lights come down. All of our lights are on dimmers. So they start to come down. You know, we have our dinner, we get everything cleaned up and we kind of just start that, that walk down series. And it, it makes it so much easier for us and for our kids to simmer down. And mm -hmm. um, currently our youngest is on the spectrum. And for the most part, as long as, you know, as long as we do that nighttime routine, he typically takes a warm shower. We have everything kind of little teeth brushing routine. Everything is like predictable, you know, with what's coming out. Exactly. I'm telling mm -hmm. you, that kid hits the bed, he is out. I oh, mean, he's great. like, give me my blanket, you can go. Um, but like, yeah. it takes about two hours for us to go from start to finish for like his walk down and what that looks like. And it's nothing specific, you know, it's just bringing volume down, bringing activities down and adding, we like adding the warm shower that works really well for him. It's relaxing. Um, and then putting it right into the next series of events. So the body knows I'm going to brush my teeth and then what comes next, I'm going to go into my room and it's going to be quiet. Um, and so, and there's no other distractions and in all of our rooms, we don't have TVs on, we don't have, we don't fall asleep to the TV. We don't, uh, you know, all the stuff that gets our brain thinking and trying to pay attention. It's none of that is in any of our rooms and it, it just works a lot better. Cause I think that's the other thing is that we bring lights down, but then we increase the distraction with mm -hmm. looking at phones or looking at televisions or reading the news or like something that's going to just kind of get you amped up again. It's like, right. No. Like, yeah, not I love work. what you do. Uh, yeah. If all the parents can do the same for their children, right. That would be awesome. Children really need a bedtime routine, especially. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then need the parents to help them build such a bedtime routine to help them yeah. understand or start doing step one, leading to all these other steps. My brain already knows I'm going to go to sleep by like step 10, for example. Exactly. And, Every single yeah. day. And it works for me. It helps me. Yeah. So why wouldn't it help, you know, kiddos who have no control, right? They don't get to say when they want to get up, say when they go to bed, you know, like it's like, you know, they, it's just, it gives the brain that sense of like, I know what's happening. Nothing's being right. done to me. I'm not, these demands aren't being placed on me. that are seemingly um, unfair, right? Um, yeah, it's like, no, we all have the acceptance of this is how the night goes. And then it's just like easy peasy. So yeah, and I think also that empowers children mm -hmm. uh, that they have some ability to soothe themselves. Mm -hmm. They they are able to right, um cope with stress, relax their body, relax their mind. And then they allow their body and the brain to fall asleep. And I think adults can really learn from that, right? Oh, yeah. It's the same, it's the same principle behind it. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I think, and I think that's a lot of like my patients who are in pain. So that's our number one goal is that if, and on the eval day, if they're in a lot of pain, I ask, are you sleeping through the night? And they say, no, that's my number one thing that we work on first, because I don't want to create any sort of, of a habit or pattern that now we're going to have to break. So it's this negative association with every single time I lie down, then that's when my pain is worse. So I can't get comfortable. If I turn on my right side, it pinches again. And so there's this tension that's associated with going to bed and that's like terrible for your health. Right. right. So the number one thing we're going to work on is how do we, how do we fall asleep? How do we get our, prepare our body to be able to fall asleep? If you're somebody that's in pain, there's going to be specific things we can do to prep for whatever that is. If every t time you turn onto your right side, your shoulder kills, put a barrier so you can't turn onto your right side, right? Mm -hmm. So on your back left side lying, perfect. Then we're going to prevent you from getting that, that pinch and that startle that happens. And if like, I'm telling you, like the faster that you can kind of not be afraid of sleep and, and have a positive relationship with sleep again, like the better, because the longer that goes on, the harder it is to break those negative associations. Um, Cause it, they can go on for a very long time. It's this belief system of, oh no, every time I sleep, my neck is worse. That, when I hear that, that's a belief system. And so we've got to work on, is it is it actually that the neck is worse because of lying down or is there a, also something going on with, I believe that my neck is worse when I'm lying down. And so, and that's that with sleep, anxiety, trying to fall asleep, you know, all of this, like trying to force myself to sleep sometimes turns into this belief system of I'm not a good sleeper. I'm not good at falling asleep. And we believe that. And it doesn't have to be that by any means. Um, there are some people that literally can at the end of the day, sit down and fall asleep sitting up, right? Like they're just like, done like literally like my husband he like sits down we're gonna sit down kind of watch a show <laughs> like passed out on the couch right um like he relaxes like that right <laughs> yeah i need an hour i need an hour to just calm down be done with the day so that i can like really fall asleep and so we're just different like that and it doesn't make me a bad sleeper it just means that I just need more time to simmer down than he needs. Um, and so, but I think there, there's times where you can feel like I'm not good at this, um, right. but that's not the case, right? Just yeah. different. Of, accept who we are, accept yeah. uh, how we sleep, right? What our body needs. And if you need more one down, do more one down. Your husband right. does not need it. Then he does not need it. Perfect. Yeah. Right. I really like what you mentioned, the mindset is is somewhat is a mind game. And that's why uh, when we treat insomnia, it's not medical doctor treating insomnia. It's a psychologist, sleep psychologist treating insomnia because insomnia is more like a mental uh, health kind of disorder. And Absolutely. a big part of that is how you perceive sleep, how horrible that is uh, versus the reality right? How you really sleep, how you think you sleep versus how you really are sleeping. Normally there's a huge gap there. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, I think, I think that's again, the myth of like, I'm good at this. I'm not good at this. I'm, you know, and uh, I, I really try and especially when I'm working with patients that like make large statements like that, it's like, that's okay. I needed to know that that's helpful. Um, so our conversation can shift in a way of like, let's challenge that belief system and let's work on making sure that how we're setting it up is empowering you. So this, you can do this, this, and this, like, these are all things you can do. You own it. And then from here, um, now it's your job to challenge belief system, <laughs> right? Yeah. Are you actually bad at this? Um, or are you not? I don't think you are. My belief system is different than yours. So like, oh, I didn't realize I was doing that. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I do it too. Hey, listen, I live in a glass house and I throw stones all the time. Okay. So, <laughs> so when I have somebody challenge my belief system and say, is that what you really believe? And you go, oh, wow. I have been believing this when it, that's not a belief system thing, you know, like, 
not mm-hmm. bad at falling asleep. I just take longer than my husband. That's all. Um, we're just different. Mm-hmm. Huh. Maybe difference. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Love those. <laughs> right? Maybe if I need nine hours, that's, mm-hmm. I'm not bad at sleeping. I just need nine hours to recover. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if I need five hours to recover, that doesn't mean I'm bad at sleeping. It means I really only need five hours. So I think listening to your body, listening to your physiology and what it's telling you is ultimately the answer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, kind yeah. of always. Yeah. Right. Let it go. Let it be. Go with the flow. I know it's easier to say than done, but. So much uh, easier to say. Right. But that's the that's the core. All this treatment for insomnia is trying to allow people to accept who they are, how their body is, how their sleep look like, and reduce the sleep anxiety. Yeah. And so if you start a pattern, a rhythm, right? We'll say like bedtime is at 10, wake up is at six, right? I'm gonna do it for a week and feel better, right? Mm. It, it has to be I think uh, we have to be careful about that <laughs> yeah and if this pattern really work for you if it is then yes if it isn't like you you are someone naturally fall asleep at 12 your night out but you force yourself to go to bed at 10 every day that also causes problem exactly yeah yeah so and that's the thing is like and like I try and like again if you didn't hit the nail on the head on the very first attempt guess what? Most people don't. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. It usually it takes, you know, a number of different strategies. So mm-hmm. one aspect of what you changed might be working. So my rhythm of glucose regulation for how my day works might be completely different than your day. You mm-hmm. know, um, there's, there's some people that really like to start their day with a large meal and then eat a larger meal at lunch and then barely anything for dinner. I don't, I, I was forcing myself to eat this larger breakfast because you're supposed to start your day with this big meal, right? That's, that's how you start your day. But I'm like, it just heavy and it sits in me and I don't feel the best. If I start my day with like a lighter meal, I start with a smoothie. It's like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. Right. And so like my glucose regulation, really, I amp up into my bigger meal at lunch and then I amp back down. Right. Other people are different. And so it just took me a long time to realize that like, oh, if I don't do what everybody does, I feel better. (laughs) So and the same thing goes with like with everything really in your life. So if something is working for you and it's not causing harm, it's it's probably good. Um, so the more you kind of figure that out, it just seems like the pieces start coming into place because then the, how your body's functioning on a day-to-day basis. And when your body's telling you something and you listen to it, then that trust level with your body is built. And so then that's when I think sleep really starts getting better because you can actually like hear what your body's saying. It's like, I feel so much better with nine hours. I mean, I have so many people that tell me they feel terrible and they're embarrassed to say that they need nine hours of sleep. I'm like you're in a safe place. You can say anything. I'm not going to judge you. Um, that might be the answer, right? Mm-hmm. You might need more calm down time. You might need something that's different than what everybody else is telling you they need, but are they telling you the truth? Really? Um, <laughs> that's mm-hmm. like, not everybody tells you the truth. They're going to tell you the best version of the truth. Um, yeah. so your truth is yours. It's your journey. It's your story. Um, And I think the more that you make it yours and not somebody else's, and we don't compare against somebody else, I think that's when the real answers start coming out um, from my perspective and what I see. So, Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Value our own body and our own needs, right? Start from there. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you, I love that you talk about sleep and help people sleep. Uh, It's just, it's one of those topics that, it can feel like there must be a blood test I can run. There must be like a brain scan I can do, right? There's got to be this like evidence that something's wrong with me. And um, that's because that's what we're used to, right? We're used to in the Mm -hmm. medical system, we run this panel and they see, oh, here it is right here. Do you see that right there? We're gonna go ahead and give you a medication and that medication is gonna fix it, right? There's never this, 
not never, there's not as much of the time there of this onus of like, it's your body. And so we're going to work over here to help you regain power and control over your own body. Mm -hmm. Right. Like yeah. that's not super common in the healthcare system, but when you work in the mental health world and in my world, physical therapy, that's a huge part of what we do, which yeah. is, this is your journey. And we're going to help you be the leader in your journey. And that's, what's like, I love talking with people in the mental health world. Um, Cause it's like, it's, it's just like, I feel like kindred spirits. <laughs> Yeah, now we all, I also love to talk to people like you right now, like uh, mind body, right? It's a holistic view. It's mm -hmm. all connected together. Myself, I was benefited. Uh, I benefit from both mindset shift and uh, eating well and try to exercise well, right? So I really think you you need work on all of those to to make our life better and better. And you really feel better is the, is the honest answer. Uh, you know, there's this like ongoing joke of like, uh, don't be friends with a the runner. They even run on vacation. Um, <laughs> um, but like, yeah, cause I run. Um, but the real thing is, is I feel better. Yes. I feel better when I run than when I don't run. And I don't, I, I don't need to run to race. I don't need to be faster than you. Um, that's not why I run. I run because I feel better. Um, and I love exploring new cities on foot. Um, I love, it's a great way for me to start my day. I just feel energized. I feel ready to go. Like I've, I've given my body this burst that it needs and it's like, I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, and so it's one of those things that, but that's not for everybody. Um, but for me, my mind, body, my breathing rate, my, as I breathe, as I run, there's breath with my stride, um, how it becomes almost meditative in a way. Um, and so that connection, I'm now more in tune with myself for the rest of the day. Um, I just am. Um, other people do yoga, other people do Tai Chi, other people swim or who knows what, I mean, the list goes on. Uh, mm -hmm. But that connection with yourself is hugely important um, for being able to um, truly listen to what your body's telling you and just stay true to that. Um, if people want to like say whatever they say, like let them say it. Not yeah. their journey, right? Mm -hmm. Yours. Yeah. Right, right. We need to be non judgmental to ourselves. If exactly. that's what our body needs, that's what our body needs. That's what it needs. Mm -hmm. That's not, you're not hurting anybody. So it's like, mm -hmm. okay, that's cool, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> Right. Love that. Love all this. I think this is really helpful to whoever are listening or watching. Yeah. Yeah. And just kind of, and you know, the way I usually end our episodes is just by saying like, Hey, if this information is helpful to somebody that, you know, somebody in your life, share this episode with them, you know, hopefully they don't feel it as a judgmental share as like a, Hey, I found this to be helpful. Like you might as well, um, because that's going to be how more conversation is, is going to grow off of some of the simple strategies. That's not full of quick fixes. Um, because the answer is there's typically not a super quick fix for a lot of things in life. Um, mm -hmm. There really is a little bit more complexity to it. And just yeah. pause, breathe and say, you know what, let me take a step back and see if I can look at this from a different angle. Um, so, and also yeah. make sure to um, follow Dr. Ishan. Uh, she's got a podcast called Deep Into Sleep. Uh, we'll post all of the information about her in episode description below. We've got social media links, all of that fun stuff. And also just make sure to like, like this episode, uh, if this is stuff that you like to hear and uh, follow, and that way you'll stay up to date on all things that are going on with two gals. All right, everybody, we'll see you next week.